fill in details. We'll try to give you a general impression of what went on uh, with the Jewish people regarding chaplains, GIs, and Americans who work with them, Israelis, and the DPs themselves. Your first question, where and when did you first encounter Jewish survivors of the Holocaust? The chronology, very briefly, is that uh, Hanukkah 1945, that would be December, uh, I crossed uh, the ocean uh, with a uh, ship that bore only chaplains of all faiths, and there were a large contingent of Jewish chaplains. Uh, we um, came over to, landed in France, and then we went over to the second Repel Depot, as we called it, the replacement depot, which was in Namur, Namen is its Flemish name, in Belgium. And that was a distribution point. We sat around there for a few days, waiting to be sent to various places. I'm not exactly sure why, for some reason, I remained as the chaplain of Namur. Uh, maybe I said something, maybe I volunteered. I usually make that kind of a mistake, but I remained there. Uh, while we were there, all of the chaplains became aware that there was a Jewish community there. We had gone to services there. And uh, I had a very interesting experience. I was there from uh, January through, through up m uh, May, I think, is when we left. Uh, as it was a replacement depot, many GIs came through and on the way to Germany. There's a uh, synagogue uh, on the river, probably the River Jam. The, the point was the confluence of the Jam and the Meuse rivers in Namur. And right on the river there was a little building, a little storefront kind of thing, and a long room which served as the uh, synagogue center. And apparently the GIs uh, knew that services were there every Friday night. And some would come who were able to conduct services and they would do so for the Jewish community. It consisted of about 30, maybe 40 people. Uh, to answer your question, those were the first Jewish survivors that I uh, encountered. Uh, some of them were concentration camp victims, but the majority of them were uh, people who uh, uh, had hidden over in one place or another during the war and had come to Namir. A few of them from the place, but a large group of them from Germany, including the head of the community, an attorney from Berlin, whose name was Burak, Monsieur Burak. Uh, his wife and his two sons, one of whose names I can recall was Werner, uh, who I believe is now in Israel. Anyway, the Borax served as a center for the GIs. We not only I, uh, began conducting services there uh, for all the GIs passing through, but we also used it as a um, center to meet with the uh, Jewish people, the community. Um, Mr. Burak uh, and Mrs. Burak would make Shabbos for those soldiers who wanted to come again Saturday morning. Whoever came to services Saturday morning, we took them to the Burak home where we had a real Shabbat dinner. And from my chaplaincy funds, perhaps JWB funds, I uh, gave Burak some money. He was able to go to uh, Br Brussels, Bruxelles and buy some chickens and all these things. And we had very nice Sabbath dinners all the time that I was there. A number of uh, interesting uh, people came through whom I later met in Germany. I've mentioned them to you in a letter, uh, notably David Schachter, David Barel, and Eliezer Dembitz, both of whom had been born, I believe, in Israel and raised in America, and both spoke uh, fluent uh, Hebrew. And uh, all right, uh, I think the opposite was the case. They were born in America and raised in Israel. They were American citizens. That's why they were serving in the, in the uh, army. A young man by the name of David Marcus, a soldier, uh, wanted to stay on and serve as my chaplain's assistant, and he did so. We were together those six months in Belgium and uh, the year in Frankfurt. In fact, when I left for Frankfurt for Austria later, he still stayed on uh, in Frankfurt.
Now, in addition to the uh, Jewish community there, we had a lot of activity with the Jewish community. We had a very large Purim party uh, to which uh, children came and other things. The soldiers and the children it was a very uh, fine affair. Um, we discovered that nearby, near Namir, uh, there was a place called Lev. It's either L-E-V-E-S or L-E-S-V-E-S. A small place which served as a kibbutz hachshara for displaced persons, young people who gathered there and began preparing and training uh, for to go to Israel. It took me some after a number of visits to discover that it was more than just a hachshara. It was actually an aliyah bet uh, point. Uh, it was a place for orphan children and hachshara for young people. But that was also a front uh, and a point at which the uh, brigade uh, would come in their uh, Allied trucks or British trucks from Antwerp and from Brussels. And it was a point that was not far from another point called Marcan. And Marcan was actually the crossing over point uh, out of uh, Belgium and into France. We had... Um, a um, Seder at one time at Lev, at the kibbutz. We had some Sabbaths there. We taught some classes there. Uh, and uh, that was the first time that I learned personally of what was going on in Europe. As far as Ali Abet was concerned, uh, the uh, soldiers from the uh, brigade and that Israelis were serving in the British Army and all of these... Um, uh, uh, the setup that is, is well known to us now. One of the areas uh, that isn't covered in your questionnaire first came to the fore here at this point, and that was regarding Jewish children who had survived the war uh, by uh, being taken care of by Christian families. And there were apparently quite a number of such children uh, in Belgium. Uh, I went to such a home later on in the Brussels area, but especially here, I became acquainted with one Père André. Father André lived right next door, in fact, in the same building as the, the one that uh, housed the officers, all the officers of the second replacement depot there in Namur. And next door to the Hotel Darskamp, Horse Camp, we used to call it, H-A-R-S-C-A-M-P, uh, in that building, he ran a place called Am Delang, Home of the Angels. And he was a, a Catholic priest, a very uh, uh, fine, uh, lively, uh, outgoing man with whom I had very small communication due to my very small French. <laughs> and, uh, however, uh, we did communicate, and with the help of Mr. Barak, I learned that uh, he had hidden personally uh, apparently 20 to 30, as far as I can recall right now, that's what he admitted to. I use the word admitted because later on we got into a little disagreement about the future of these children. Uh, 20 to 30 in various homes, and he knew, he said, where they all were. And um, we were friendly, but our, the, our basic discussion still remained, what should happen to these children? He couldn't understand why in the world I wanted them to do anything but what they were doing. They were fine. They were in good Catholic homes. And, uh, and uh, as is well known to me, he assumed uh, you can't really be uh, a good Catholic unless you're a Jew, so that we were really better Catholics already to start with. All this in a very friendly way, you know, not the kind of atmosphere you might encounter in America. Very sincere and, and very, very fine person. Uh, so that these children now, being Jews and being raised as Catholics, uh, you know, their place in heaven was, was certainly assured, and what more could I want? And he was really quite surprised by my um, firm but gentle insistence that perhaps these children might be better off in Israel, and perhaps they could be reunited with families in Israel, and so on. I don't recall exactly what organizations I alerted to the situation in Brussels, probably the Joint or whatever organizations there were there, but there were Jewish organizations, one of which ran a large orphan home for children that we visited a few times. In any case, uh, he gave me two, three, or four, I think perhaps three or four, 
uh, names of children uh, that I was able to pass on to the organization, but I didn't follow through on that because the organization said that they were already working on this throughout the country and that this was a new lead that they hadn't had, but now that they had made contact with him and they were sure that over a period of time they would be able to obtain the release of uh, these children or most of these children, and I think perhaps they did. We had a large Passover service in the theater in Namur, which served as an opera house. Unlike the United States, where very few cities have operas, even uh, at, th at that time, a small town like Namur had its own opera. And uh, we um, served a, a large dinner uh, for uh, the community, for all the Jewish soldiers in the area. And at any day, there were hundreds, literally, uh, of Jewish soldiers amongst the thousands who passed through the replacement depot because they would sp stay a week, uh, 10 days, two weeks. And we also invited some of the top brass of the American army. And it was... Uh, uh, the affair of the year there in Namur, certainly for the Jewish community. Now, um, to move on, uh, just a couple more points, because I want to get to Germany. Um, I uh, became acquainted with the uh, Officers Club in Brussels and the Officers Club of, uh, uh, in, in, um, in Antwerp. I'm not referring to general officers, I'm referring to the Jewish uh, officers, I mean soldiers clubs the Jewish Brigade Clubs. And uh, I really learned that there was quite a lot going on, and that it was quite a, a heavy point of traffic. And one of the dramatic times, or, or perhaps twice, I remember the convoys coming through with Jews and crossing the Marcan points. I didn't have an active role either in organizing or leading, but in consulting and already learning some of the names of some of the people in Bricha whom I was later to meet in, in Germany and in Austria and other places. When I go to my files and look at letters and other records, I'll uh, fill in on some of the uh, events that might be of some interest uh, during the stay in Namir. Then we went on, uh, David Marcus and I got into a Jeep. Our possessions had already been, or perhaps they were in a trailer behind us. I didn't know what I had, a couple of foot lockers in May 1945, and we uh, rolled on out of uh, Belgium into Germany, 46, 1946, right, uh, into Germany. I remember going through the town of Aachen, and uh, that was the first encounter of a really badly beat up town. Uh, saw the signs of war everywhere, and it was interesting that I got acquainted with that town to some degree because later on we had an adventure with Jewish DPs in Aachen that I'll refer to. Answer question two, just generally, as to the army unit. Uh, I already mentioned the second replacement depot in Namir, and I was on my way to headquarters command Frankfurt, Germany, and my third station and final one in Europe was the 4th Constabulary Regiment in Linz, Austria. I now come to uh, question three, which is a very long question. You say, what other experience did you have with the remnants of European Jewry? And of course, that is uh, what we did. We had experiences with the remnants of European Jewry. Now, uh, Alex, we're sitting here in my home tonight, and my wife is here. Her name is Kay. She was called Atara. Uh, over in Europe by the Israelis in those days, and Yehuda Lev, who was known as Johnny Lowe in those days, is also here. I brought them here so that together we can try to recollect uh, and um, remember and try to reconstruct as much as possible of this uh, question, especially since uh, Yehuda was involved in my total Frankfurt experience, and Kay both in Frankfurt and in... Um, in uh, Linz, Austria. In June 1946, uh, Kay crossed on a Liberty ship together with American wives and joined me in Paris and we proceeded to Frankfurt where we lived until, until uh, February 47. Uh, Yehuda reminds me that since I was at the bar mitzvah of Philip Bernstein's son, 
That took place in February. So it was about February that we moved over to Linz. And we ma remained in Linz uh, to June 47. All right. All right, now we're coming to a, uh, a long, and it's not going to be a terribly organized discussion that we're going to put on tape, uh, really uh, covering all the questions on, on page two, from three on down and on page three. I'm going to, uh, however, limit myself in this initial phase to some of the things that went on in uh, Frankfurt. Uh, leaving it to your uh, good judgment to reorganize and to order, because if we try to order it now, it will mean another delay, and I don't want to delay it, and we'll just uh, go at various topics. About the position of the Jewish chaplain in Frankfurt, I replaced Rabbi Isaiah Rakowski, who had been the local Frankfurt chaplain. That was my position. I was chaplain of Frankfurt. Uh, in Frankfurt, too, though, besides the the headquarters of uh, Frankfurt-based uh, personnel, there was the headquarters of uh, the European Army, uh, located in the I. Gay Farben building. And at that time, General McNamara, I believe, was the name, you can check it, was in charge of, uh, or head of the uh, Army setup. That's not, I guess the McNamara I'm mixing up with the, the local one here. Uh, I, uh, it was Mac something, perhaps it'll come to me. Yeah, it was General McNarney. Thank you, Yehuda. Now, uh, in that I. Gay Farben building uh, was, and attached to McNarney's office, uh, was um, uh, Rabbi Philip Bernstein of Rochester, uh, who was at that time the chief advisor to the general on the affairs of uh, European Jewry. With Rabbi Bernstein working out of the central office, were two people who were rather important to all the chaplains and to myself, with whom we came into a lot of contact. Uh, one was Abe Hyman, uh, who was in the adjutant uh, general's office, I believe, but somehow later on became attached to Bernstein full-time, I believe largely as a result of his efforts in the Stuttgart affair and trial. Also, I'll come to uh, a description of an adventure that my wife and I had with Abe Hyman in the matter of Reich Bogatsky in Castle, Germany. To Abe Hyman, one of the chaplains, a promising young, tall chaplain by the name of Herb Friedman, who also happened to be from Rochester, uh, was uh, attached to Rabbi Bernstein's office. Herb, uh, you know, later became the uh, executive uh, secretary of the UJA, uh, but he was there with us during those times. I mention this because it was through Rabbi Bernstein's office that all of the chaplains got together. We had a couple of regional conferences. Later on, I'll pull out the uh, photograph I have of that conference and try to name as many of the chaplains uh, uh, that were there. I remember uh, Bert Klein. I remember uh, Bill Dahlen. I remember uh, Mike Meyer Abramowitz and others. But when I look at the... Um, at the photograph, I'll give you all the names of, of the chaplains that I can reconstruct. A general comment at this point about Jewish chaplains, uh, my impression of Jewish chaplains might not be out of order. There were, I would ca uh, classify them as three kinds of Jewish chaplains. This is just a very personal, subjective impression, so you may get certainly others. Uh, there were those who saw their jobs uh, as American chaplains in the American army whose job was to take care of the uh, uh, soldier and uh, really stuck to that, uh, although it was impossible to stick to that completely. But I know I could probably think of two or three who really did almost only that. Kay has the impression that perhaps sometimes they didn't even know uh, anything else was going on. I'm not quite sure of that, but in any case, uh, they were kind of army people. They were definitely a minority. There's no question about that, just a handful of that and that. On the other uh, end, there was another minority, uh, also just a handful of chaplains, who, uh, because of their contacts and the previous experience in the United States, uh, saw their entire mission as uh, working with the Jewish people, especially with Israelis, 
and uh, neglected their contact with the GI, I use the word neglected from their point of view, it wasn't neglect, I suppose, uh, to the extent of uh, bravado. Uh, one of them, uh, I believe, was sent home, at least that's what he told me, I know he was sent home, uh, uh, because uh, the, by the army, because he was caught practicing uh, with the uh, <laughs> with the with the uh, in the in the woods with wooden rifles. Uh, and uh, well, uh, you his name is known to you. His name is in 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 the uh, in the files of the JWB, and I'm sure you're you're getting some. I'll mention his name later in other connections. I work with him, so that you will know about him. Uh, in the middle somewhere were most of us who worked somewhat uh, with, the G with the GI and somewhat uh, with the DPs. I was on the, uh, in that middle group, uh, on the, in the group that worked mostly by far with the DPs. I would say 90% of my time was in, uh, with the work with the Jewish people, but I never neglected my GIs, uh, I'm just talking personally, because I felt that uh, it was the only way I could, uh, I had two reasons really. One, it was the only way I could continue doing uh, some of the things that I was doing, which I knew were illegal and which the Army would frown upon, but I felt as long as I kept my nose clean and turned in the monthly reports and had services, uh, that uh, as far as the Army was concerned, I was doing my job. And so, uh, uh, so they wouldn't uh, be after me and I could do more things. And I think that that's exactly the way it turned out. I, I involved myself very heavily in many things, including Aliyah Bet and, uh, and uh, other things that you mentioned and we'll get to. And I got away with it completely. I never got into any kind of jam of any kind. Um, I was amongst the few, I think, uh, American chaplains who spoke fluent Yiddish. There were a few chaplains in the American army, like Bert Klein that I mentioned, who were really European, uh, of European background. Uh, incidentally, I was born in Europe, but I came to America at the age of eight. So that essentially uh, I was raised and educated in America, but the Yiddish remained with me, probably from Plonsk, the uh, town in which I was born. So I was able to communicate very openly and um, and made close friends amongst the DPs and uh, got into a number of councils and meetings in, in uh, ways that I'll describe later. Now, uh, while Yehuda is here tonight, let's talk about the GI Council. Uh, there's no particular chronological order, uh, but uh, I think that this was a, an important manifestation. I don't know if it was the only uh, GI group in Europe, but it certainly maybe was the first and unique in many ways, perhaps the largest. The um, offices of the Jewish Welfare Board uh, were my headquarters. Uh, I think there was somebody else there representing JWB. The name of the person who will, uh, who, whom I replace there, uh, will come back to me. Actually, I didn't replace him because he was working for the JWB, I think. Perhaps joined, no, JWB, and I was working, uh, I was a chaplain. Anyway, it was at number six, Elza Bramstromstrasse. I remember it, it was at the end of a dead-end street. The, um, the office was not far from the Friedrichstrasse Synagogue. To digress a moment about a point that I might forget later, uh, we later on of that year, he has services in that synagogue, a very large synagogue, very beautiful uh, domed synagogue, huge building, uh, Frankfurt uh, Synagogue, you know, of the Frankfurter Yehuden, and it um, uh, this was distinguished in, in that the Nazis apparently, or somebody, I don't know who they, who they were stealing from, but somebody took off all of the marble and all of the precious decorations of the synagogue. And so I came to the army and I uh, really couldn't ask them to ship marble from Italy to redo the synagogue, although we had thought of something. Uh, but they did agree to have it painted. I think we got a kind of a cobalt uh, color paint and they gave us some men and they repainted the whole synagogue, all those places that were pockmarked from marble being removed. and. The whole thing was very, very uh, beautiful, and we had a very large service with all of the 
This place, cursed uh, persons coming from uh, especially Salzheim, the largest camp nearby, but from everywhere, from Hex, from all the communities around, even from Wiesbaden, and for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And I conducted the services, and uh, uh, Chaplain uh, Herb Friedman uh, uh, assisted me, uh, sat on the bima with me, and so on. And that was a large, uh, a large uh, service. <laughs> yeah, we just had a little fun uh, discussing reform rabbis off the record. <laughs> In any case, uh, we uh, we uh, at Elsa Bramstrom Strasse uh, had a uh, mixed uh, congregation. Uh, a number of people who uh, came from to, came to us from Salzheim regularly, Jews, uh, uh, concentration camp survivors. A number of people came to us who apparently had found a way to live in uh, Frankfurt, Germany. For example, one name that comes to me is Dr. Johanna Spector. I don't know if I gave you her name. I probably didn't because she's a very busy person, but she certainly would know a lot about Jewish life in those days. She lived in Frankfurt, maintained herself in a small room by trying to give piano lessons and so on. Uh, she uh, she uh, was... Uh, a, Estonian, Lithuanian, La- uh, Latvian, uh, Latvian, uh, and but she had been educated in music in Vienna. She was a concert pianist, married to a concert pianist. Her husband, oh, violinist. Her husband was a violinist, <laughs> so a music critic on a newspaper. And she uh, she uh, lost her husband, who was killed. A uh, uh, great tragedy to her, of course, by the Nazis. And uh, she, she would come to services, and, and we made friends with her. She later uh, took a Ph.D. in the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, and today is the head of the Department of Ethnomusicology at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, where you can find her. And she might recall some of these things. She also uh, was down in Austria later on. That was typical. There were individuals who came... Uh, and Kay reminds me that in addition to uh, regular shulgoers, there was quite a large young crowd there because the young GIs came when they saw that there were some attractive DP girls around, most of them from the camps and some of them from the city. And it was uh, fairly lively, I would estimate, and now I'm a better judge of congregations, and then it wasn't a large hall, but I would estimate we had over 100 people there every Friday night, something like that. First floor, First floor downstairs. Uh, it reminds me that it wasn't only the girls that were the attraction. Uh, the, we served salami and uh, bread, Kay says. Uh, those were cans that were sent over, I believe, by the JWB. And I remember that. And salami. Uh, salamis, yes. I used to get from the commissary on my $50 a month alone. I don't know if you're picking that up. Mrs. Miller says the bread... She used to get from the commissary on her $50 allowance. Which $50 allowance? Oh, no, no, no. What they would let about? you buy, let you spend in the commissary. As an officer's wife, I could oh, buy $50 worth of groceries. Oh, we were only allowed to buy $50 worth of groceries a month, so we bought some bread. And uh, then uh, uh, Yehuda says there were Cokes, and that was a great, great thing that uh, there were Cokes to be had. And anyway, we had uh, a very nice Friday evening service. I can still see the place. Uh, The only unfortunate part was that while I'm a reasonable rabbi, I'm a lousy chazan. And uh, once in a while, I could, (laughs) I I get general agreement around here. And once in a while, I I, uh, managed to uh, inveigle one of the DPs to Davin, but usually I I conducted the service uh, also. Uh, Yes, there was also a chazan who came from Salzheim who, who did some of the parts of the service. But the congregational singing uh, I led. And Kay reminds me, in exchange for which I found him a room. In Zaltan, because he had no ration card, and there was no burial legal. I see. And the man, and, which we did very often. I'm going to change the rules here a little bit, which is the, really the ones I started, but these people are sitting so far away. I hope you don't mind, because I'm not repeating the their memories with the same flavor and enthusiasm that they have. For example, Kay has a memory about the chazan. Would you repeat it? The chazan uh, agreed to be the chazan in exchange for us going to the head of UNRWA at Salzheim and getting him um, 
registered as a legal person there. There were many people who were there with, without cards. Either they doubled up or tripled up with other people. And they had no ration cards. I don't know where they were supposed to be or why they couldn't get ration cards. And I remember going to one under head, and he said, it's impossible, I can't give him a, a, a legal status because the place is already overcrowded and I don't have any number or ration card or place for him and he can't stay. But of course he had already been staying, it's just that he was not there on the records. Um. Uh, to uh, try to reconstruct how the GI Council came about. I think it's a, a, a very important manifestation and a really uh, uh, traded and directed the efforts of uh, quite a large number of GIs in a, in, a, in a very good direction. Probably uh, it began with descriptions of Jews uh, perhaps by myself in sermons, at least as an idea, I, uh, not my idea, but an I, uh, I was describing to the um, congregation where they were. It was something that I was finding out more day by day as I got acquainted with what was going on in Southheim. We'll talk about the camps in a moment. And some of the other smaller places where people lived. And it became very clear that a large number of Jews were still coming in and uh, that those who were coming in fresh would have conditions that were even worse than those who were already there and they would be placed into temporary camps and so on, which turned out to be the case, and that they needed help. Uh, in the congregation, uh, there were a large number of Americans, and notably two that I had already mentioned, whom I had met, at least Eliezer, I'm sure I had met in Amir, Eliezer Dembitz and David Barel. And uh, they sat down with me uh, after services, and uh, we discussed the matter of forming uh, some kind of an organization. Uh, I'm perfectly free, if there's a question of credit, I don't know what it is, to to share it at least with these two as far as the origination of the idea is concerned. It grew out of a, a talk and a, and a discussion with them. And uh, we decided that we could do that. We could have an organization and uh, that we would uh, have um, these particular functions, the general idea being to see what we could do to help the Jewish people. And we called it the GI Council well, I'm not quite sure what the name of it was, except that I have a, a large plaque uh, that, that they presented to myself and Kay when we left uh, Frankfurt, which reads, The GI Council of Frankfurt, Germany. Now, uh, the council members included those that I've mentioned, Yehuda here, included Dave Lippert, uh, Pearl Fink, uh, uh, and uh, Avram Levinson, now in the um, advertising, advertising business, prominent in Israel, uh, and many, many names. Perhaps some of them I'll, I'll come back to when I look at my records. Uh, the council would uh, uh, gather material and uh, set dates, often on a Sunday when the soldiers were off, sometimes on other days, and fulfill functions such as delivering material to various camps, uh, uh, visiting children's homes, later on presenting programs for Passover, for Purim. We, they did a big show for Purim that they prepared. And they, uh, and they went around to various camps, being friendly with the people, playing with the children. I have a photograph of Eliezer Dembitz and some of the other members of the council, Tilly and uh, some of the names of the girls, I can't remember. Uh, in a large field, we took them to a castle near Frankfurt for a whole day outing. And Kay is in the picture. Uh, and... Um, and so on. Of course, the, uh, the, the greatest thing we did for them, for the people, was simply to be there. And they saw, you know, 
uh, Jews in uniform, Americans in uniform, they were all excited about us. I remember once uh, we came into a camp and a little boy started, must have been about three years old, and he started to scream hysterically, and uh, his mother tried to comfort him, and then she finally, uh, either she asked us, please go away, and then she explained that when he saw anybody in uniform, uh, he this terrible fear would come over him, of course, and that he had been born and and the first two three years of his life lived in a cellar, and uh, the sight of a uniform was still that frightening to him, so that when he saw the American GIs, he just started to scream hysterically, he was just trembling, it was a terrible sight to see. Why you have the microphone? Can you recall the orange story? What? Oh, why now? It's not in... All right, think about it. We'll come, we'll come to it later. One day, a young man came up to me, I presume after services, I can't remember the exact time, and uh, he saw that something was going on there, and we were talking about needs and so on. Brash young fellow, I think he must have been about 18, <laughs> and, uh, you know, a snotty American kid, knew it all. A rosy cheeked, and uh, he said, uh, "He said, uh, what do you need?" I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, you're talking about you're helping people and you need some stuff." I said, "What do you need?" I was thinking, I think of Ziegenhain at the time, and I'll we'll talk more about it in detail. And I said, uh, uh, with uh, uh, a bit of sarcasm in my voice, "Oh, two thousand blankets. How soon do you need it?" <laughs> he didn't even take a breath. And of course, I just uh, kind of wrote it off, but I, as the conversation continued, I began to get the idea that maybe he thought he had a source uh, which, uh, from which he could get this kind of stuff, and it turned out that he thought he did have such a source to wit his mother, <laughs> who uh, is uh, Rosamond T. Lowe of Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills? Of Beverly Hills, of Forest Hills. <laughs> well, it's a long time, mister. Um, uh, uh, well, after Mrs. Saul Lowe, Sal of blessed memory, and they were prominent members of uh, Rabbi Benzion Boxer's uh, synagogue, which was, as you know, a prominent leading synagogue. And uh, Yehuda was quite sure that uh, his mother, I mean, he wasn't sure, he was certain that his mother could send us anything we wanted to. So, uh, uh, you know, not wanting to pass up that kind of an opportunity, uh, I proceeded to tell him some of the things we needed. Uh, perhaps until that point, our efforts were kind of small because we got what we needed. I used to, I, uh, I used to get a lot of things by going to the um, PX and finding a Jewish uh, officer or a Jewish GI who worked there or was around there and tell them what I needed and why I needed it or why I wanted it. And then they would uh, give me uh, broken, uh, like broken toys or open boxes of um, candy or other things. Maybe they weren't so broken or they weren't so open. But because they were Jewish soldiers and Jewish GIs, they would get me what they could straight from the PX. In any case, there were a number of sources uh, uh, on a smaller scale uh, than the one from Forest Hills that we'll discuss in a moment. Uh, I think the Politician in Chicago somehow, perhaps through Kay's family, uh, Kay's father is Politician, I don't know, so, I somehow remember that the uh, uh, that uh, Rachel Bramson and Eli uh, began sending packages as well. Either they or somebody else through Pioneer Women, perhaps different people to whom I had written to in Chicago, and we used to start getting packages. I mean, there would... Uh, uh, Many, many packages would come from various people, and this was simply on a, on a, on the basis of letters that I sent out uh, from my office uh, in in Frankfurt in the chaplain's building. Uh, see, I had two offices. One was in Elsa Bramstromstrasse, that was with the GIs, but my main office was in the in the in the headquarters. And the interesting part is this: I discovered that the Jewish chaplain 
Uh, I suppose it's still the case in, uh, in the army, I don't know, but in those days the Jewish chaplain's function in the office was the supply officer. That was my job for the chaplain setup. I was supposed to uh, see to it that the Catholic uh, chaplain had enough wafers and the Protestant chaplain enough candles and all of that. Actually, that was no work for me at all because the gentlemen sent up their, uh, I was on the top floor, they sent up their uh, forms. I simply signed them as the supply officer and sent them on to headquarters. But I discovered that that was a very handy and a very useful form because I was able to order things and all I had to write on the bottom was, this request is not in excess of the needs of this uh, department. And, uh, and uh, uh, as we'll soon see, I ordered some very interesting things uh, with that kind of a thing. But uh, the packages, now to return to that, started coming in, a lot of packages from many places. Lo and behold, one day I get a call from a kind of frantic sergeant or someone down at the <laughs> railroad depot. Are you, are you uh, Lieutenant Miller or Chaplain? I don't know if it was Lieutenant or Chaplain Miller. I said, yes. He said, uh, did you <laughs> order two boxcars from Forest Hills? I said, boxcars? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, he says, I mean, uh, you know, boxcars full of stuff, goods from Forest Hills. I said, oh, yes, 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 we're expecting those. And I must have turned 60 different colors. He said, well, you better come down and pick them up. I said, well, uh, two boxcars, uh, about how many trucks will I need? He said, well, you're going to need some trucks. There's no question about that. There were two boxcars, as far as I can recall, from Forest Hills, and I, w I believe filled entirely with blankets, the but first they were shipments. But individually, uh, individually boxed and addressed to uh, Chaplain Miller with a, you know, with a... Uh, Cartons. What do you call that kind of an address? So that APO. With an APO number, so that uh, it wouldn't cost that much money to send it to Europe, see, if you send it to an APO also, number. Also, I recall, you had to have a request from the... You had to have a request, do I recall, from the uh, person to whom, you were send, to whom you were sending it. Yes. And so they manufactured the requests also. And there was a whole batch of these. For every package, there was a request from you. They duplicated the requests or whatever it was. Uh, uh, you, you call up uh, Rosamond T. Lowe. What's your telephone number? Murray Hill 46466. And ask her how, how the heck she got all that stuff shipped. Uh, but what Kay is suggesting then that the, the fee was much less because they simply sent it to the APO number. But they apparently had been working. Well, that was only the beginning because not only did they send the blankets, but they started a regular factory of, of shipments. And we have extensive photographs that uh, Dave Marcus and another fellow named Marcus, the tall fellow who was also in Marcus, uh, he took some pictures down there. Uh, what was the name of the gray-haired fellow? I had been working in Frankfurt for the joint. I can't remember his name. And uh, maybe when you see his picture, we'll recall it. And then he went uh, to New York and made contact. So while we were over in Frankfurt already, as months went on, more and more of our graduates, so to speak, because by 46, people were already going home. All those who went to New York gathered around Mrs. Lowe, whom we called Queenie, and they went down to the basement, and they started this package service. And I don't know if Forest Hills did anything else except bring packages over there to that basement. There was a, just a steady stream of it coming. And the importance of it was, was, was uh, it cannot be over-exaggerated. I'll give you an example. Before this kind of thing started, as I started saying, we only had our limited resources. We could ask the fellas, go buy something we need, uh, which they did, but it was still limited, you know. For example, after our initial visit to Ziegenheim, we went to Ziegenheim with the trucks. That was the worst camp we were ever, ever in, with the exception maybe of Heilbrunn, where the people only stayed two days. It was just mud. But Siegenheim was really bad, and the people were expected to stay there for a longer period of time. Incidentally, you, uh, you have on record my report to Chaplain Bernstein on our visit to Siegenheim, and that's already in the files 
of the uh, and the files of the Institute of Contemporary Juda uh, Judaism in uh, in Jerusalem. I turned over a paper called uh, called the Misplaced Persons, a hundred page document, which includes a a report on uh, Ziegenheim. In any case, we came to Ziegenheim. Uh, one of the most elementary things that struck us, all the water was in lister bags and everything was really, really so primitive. How the American army could send people there was incomprehensible. This was af through the Stettin people, you know, that came out after the Kielts riot in 46, probably in... Uh, uh, Yehuda reminds me that uh, the Poles were there originally, and when they heard the Jews were coming in, they ripped the place to pieces. In any case, it was a shambles. When we got there, the m most important thing we needed was a broom. It was obvious. The floors were just full of dirt and dust and crud, and the people were living there already. They moved them right in. A, there was nothing like a broom, so we took cardboard and we pushed the, you know, the large pieces of wood out of the way and so on, but... A broom. There wasn't one broom in the place. How does the army move people into a place like that without a broom? So we immediately went back to Frankfurt, and we put out a call to the GI Council, which by then was going, and they got all of their friends, and we went to all the PXs in the greater Frankfurt area, and that included some uh, air bases and other places, and within a period of uh, 24 hours, we bought all the brooms. And if any general or anybody else wanted a broom, they probably had to wait two weeks because we were up in Siegenheim in a period of two days with a 50, 60 brooms, with every broom that was available or 100. But that was very different from the kind of things that started coming in from Forest Hills, which gave us a lot of encouragement. Another area in which the GI Council uh, was active was in the collection of cigarettes. And this I considered one of the great mitzvahs, one of the great things that, that the fellas did. Because cigarettes were at a premium. They could take their own ration and get a lot of marks for it. They could buy a watch with those marks, whatever they wanted to. It was, it was really money. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, just offhand, that a, a carton of cigarettes...